Now you'll notice that most of the equipment is safety stuff, yeah? Oh no. Hello? You are? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I do. Sure, it's I don't believe this at gmail.com. Thank you. So if you come here through a YouTube thumbnail and you've seen that it calls this the original electric car, I probably need to explain something. I know it isn't. What sort of motoring journalist would I be if I didn't know that? This is clickbait. Anyways. But you can't really tackle the Leaf without referencing its place in the pantheon of the modern electric vehicle, which is basically front and centre. You see, there were electric cars before the Leaf. Actually, there were electric cars in the 19th century, but let's not get into that. We're talking modern electric vehicles now. So just before the Leaf came out, this thing did. And there were a couple of French versions too. But it wasn't really until the Leaf came along all silently that running an electric car became a realistic and non-embarrassing prospect. It looked normal, felt normal, and had a battery life adequate for a normal ownership experience. Ish. Real-ish. You see, here are the stats of the original Leaf. It officially had a three-figure battery range, but that was using the highly generous NEDC test, and in reality, it had about 60 miles. That's what you were getting on the streets. Still, it was enough to get the cogs turning, or the electrons flowing, if you like, on the whole electric vehicle thing. And it became wildly successful. Nissan kept improving the battery range of the first one, and in 2018, it brought a new one out, the one that we're driving today as it goes. And the result was that up until the end of 2019, it was consistently the world's best-selling electric car. Half a million sold globally and counting. Have a guess which car overtook it in 2020. Go on, I'll give you some time. <laughs> Wrong! Um... Or... Correct! Well done! Yep, something altogether more premium is now the world's most popular electric car. But actually, Elon's runabout isn't really the current Leaf's main problem. The current Leaf's main problem is its own popularity. You see, the Leaf broke ground from which has sprung the nascent electric vehicle epoch in which we now exist. In other words, we're quite early into the whole electric car thing, but there are already some very good ones. It's across all price points now, pretty much, but even if you just look in the vague area in which the Leaf exists, as in hatchbacks of the 25 to 35 grand sort, there is some real quality stuff and with a range of strengths. You got something very modern, but not very range efficient, weirdly, through to something not very modern, but very range efficient, also weirdly, and a lot more besides. And I have to say, despite coming out as recently as 2018, the latest Leaf here is already starting to feel a bit old. It's mainly because of the cabin, which has a quite early 2000s vibe about it, but with a few electric futuristic bits dotted about the place. And some of that stuff ends up looking quite incongruous. Yeah, so the cabin architecture is a non-harmonious and yet quite monotone melange of shapes and textures. There are just too many buttons in here. It's like the anti-Tesla. And yet, that doesn't necessarily make the cabin more intuitive. For example, heated seat switches down next to the USB ports, obviously. And they feel horrible as well. And the infotainment, yeah? It has shortcut buttons, which is usually a boon for ease of use. But here, it is not a boon. Not at all. The Leafs infotainment, in fact, is pure Nigel Kennedy. It's fiddly. So... And also, let's just say, it's a good job that smart phone mirroring is standard on this car because this software sucks. Anyways, there's nothing in here that's necessarily offensive, but nor is there anything that really stands out. And in fairness, it does feel very well made in a way that goes beyond just having a bit of soft touch plastic in the places you expect. In fact, it doesn't really have any soft touch plastic anywhere. 
But it does seem that Nissan was so preoccupied with making this feel normal, as in like a car with an engine, a petrol or a diesel engine, that it withheld any nod of futurism really and ended up with something of an anachronism. So like it's got a digital instrument panel of sorts, but it's a really small screen, graphics are really naff, they're quite low res, and it's next to a standard speedometer. The two things sit uncomfortably together. Having said that, the digital screen does actually give you quite a lot of useful information information you know it'll tell you exactly how much battery you've got left in a very clear way how long it's going to take you to charge the car i guess that is better than it just looking aesthetically pleasing but being useless as an information device i have to say though i absolutely hate this digital rear view mirror intelligent rear view mirror that's what it's called thankfully it's optional avoid it it's useless in the sun because the reflection means you can't see anything in it it's useless in the rain because the rain covers the little camera and it plays with your sense of perspective so when a car is pulling up slowly behind you it does appear like it's about to smash into your tailgate cars behind you end up looking so close that if you can lip read you can see what they're saying how you feeling uh, egg roll i wish i had a breeze running down my leg i'd kill for a cookie sting ray a double-sided scooby snack yeah, we pick our hotel. Plus, the display itself isn't quite bright enough, so you end up with two visual images. You can see what the camera is showing you and what the mirror is reflecting. So you're kind of seeing the same stuff twice, but from different perspectives. It's a bit jarring. Ah, oh, it's much better. Digital rear view mirrors are quite often a solution to a problem that nobody had. And the gear selector, it's flat and it's got this sort of glowing blue section on it. So it's kind of cool, right? But you still have to move it through this clunky gate to get it to work. A lot of electric cars now have buttons. This kind of feels like an old school auto. And actually, does it look futuristic? Or does it look like a normal gear selector that's been crushed in a vice? You won't be able to see that now. See? You also feel like you're sat perched on top of a battery more so than you do in other electric cars. And that's because the floor is obviously raised and the seat is quite high set on top of it. And that's no big deal, right? Mainly because there's loads of headroom here, as you can see, and the driving position is fundamentally good. See, that also gives you a hint of that SUV crossover type driving position where you feel like you're sat high on top of the road and you get good visibility. Visibility in general is good here. It's got these split air pillars and there's a bit of glass there that you can see through. Windscreen feels big, notwithstanding the rear view mirror issues rear visibility is good and lots of rear leg space for a family hatchback as you can see here although as an aside there's this quote transmission tunnel unquote running through the floor which is actually the access for the emergency battery disconnect now it's very useful but it's also annoying if you're the middle seat rear passenger boots big though as you can see whether you're looking at the boot space itself or the boot volume stats there relative to the other similarly priced electric hatchbacks. That said, you could add an electric crossover or two into the mix if you really want a big boot space with your zero emissions vehicle, and that kind of makes the Leafs boot look a bit small and a bit less useful. Particularly because the Leafs boot is quite basic. There's no twin floor, and there is this huge shelf when you drop the seats. This car will be a nightmare in Ikea. Decent amount of cabin storage though, including bottle-friendly door pockets and a decent glove box. Although it is full of manual because the Leaf's manual is thicker than a handwritten King James Bible. Still, the Leaf is actually close pricer to an electric super mini type car, you might have noticed, when actually it's more of a family hatchback, a class up. It just feels more sophisticated technologically than a lot of the smaller stuff too. Not all of it, but a lot of it. Firstly, that's because it has two drivetrains. And that's one of the ways that Nissan has kept the headline price quite low. So there's a basic one with a smaller electric motor and a smaller battery and therefore a lower range. And then your quicker, longer range one. But this is a very well specified car from the base. The big, dirty, stinking base. Big, dirty, stinking base. A big, non-dirty, non-stinking base model that looks like this. This model is only available with the smaller battery and motor setup. Now you'll notice that most of the equipment is safety stuff. Yeah, you might notice that it doesn't have knee airbags, which is a bit weird, but it does make up for that, if you like, by having a load of active safety stuff as standard. Automatic braking, rear cross traffic alert, stuff like that. And if you go one step further up the range to middle spec car, you get even more safety stuff and an absolute amount of additional luxury equipment. You also get the option of the upper drivetrain. In fact, it's a trim level so impressive that Craig David himself wrote a song about it. Tell me what you're gonna do 
And connector. I did that because it's the album cover. Born to do it. Right, I'm going to breeze past the top spec car because we've been here too long doing trim stuff. Except I will say that you'll notice that that car does get LED headlights, which I think should be standard. Oh, and Pro Pilot means that it can park itself and also drive itself in a traffic. So they all come with a 6.6 kilowatt onboard charger, meaning that if you stick it into a 7 kilowatt home wall box, you can fill up the standard car's battery in about seven and a half hours or the E Plus's bigger battery in about 11 and a half hours. Using the maximum 50 kilowatt DC rapid charging connection, which uses a Chademo, Chademo, Chademo socket, anyway, that socket, the regular Leaf takes one hour to get from 20 to 80% charge, while the E Plus needs 90 minutes to do the same thing. Charging fun, yes. So that's that. Now, finally, to the driving of the thing. So this particular car is an E+, as in the numbers that you see in front of me here. Looks quick, feels quick. In fact, on a dry road at 50 miles per hour, you can still get this car's low rolling resistance tires spinning. That tells you everything you need to know about how quick this car feels. So the first thing I'd say is that you don't need this drivetrain. You don't need your Leaf to be this quick. You might like it to be this quick, but you don't need it because electric cars, instant responsiveness, all that stuff. And by all that stuff, I mean that an electric car gives you all its torque virtually instantly. So even if you have a lower powered one, it feels responsive. It feels much more responsive than any car with an internal combustion engine that has to spool up, basically. Now, it is nice to have this turn of pace and it really does feel relentlessly quick, this thing, right up to motorway speed. But actually, it's really the battery range that you should be considering more than the performance. If you can live with a lower battery range, if you're just gonna be using this around the doors, I say, save your money. Now, over the last week, this car's given me about 180 miles out of its tank, which is good, but the truth is, you're just gonna be charging it every night anyway. And again, both Leafs, leaves <laughs> feel quick. So the performance thing isn't as important. Now the high power car does have a slightly different suspension setup to the base car, but really all that's for is to compensate for the extra weight of the bigger battery. It does mean that this will ride slightly firmer than the base car, but it's not something you'll necessarily notice. They both have the same basic characteristic. That characteristic being good body control, slightly firm ride quality underneath you, slight rumble all the time, but generally pretty sophisticated. The body control is really good around corners. It only starts to really feel too firm if you thump into a big pothole. It also has surprisingly sharp steering and that, along with the responsiveness and the fact that it's got good brake feel, it's like natural, it's not all spongy and springy like a lot of electric car brake feel is. All means that this is actually pretty good fun to drive. It's dead easy to think of a Leaf as just an eco car and therefore not a fun car. Eco car is a euphemism for not fun generally, but this is really, really good. It's got a lot of grip at the front, it's very predictable just more fun and more engaging than you think it's going to be. This car is obviously ground zero for eco-friendly motoring, so you don't expect that, and therefore it's a pleasant surprise. But the driving modes are probably the most impressive thing about the Leaf, actually. So the gearbox itself has a D mode and a B mode, B mode meaning engine braking, which means if you put it in D, then as soon as you lift off the throttle, it will slow down very obviously to try and put brake energy back into the battery. I prefer to freewheel though, because it feels more natural. You can also switch it into e-pedal mode, which gives you an even more aggressive braking effect when you lift off the throttle. And it means that actually you don't have to use the brake. So again, I don't really like one pedal driving. It's good around town, but for me, it always gives the car a sense of inertia that you feel like you have to battle against. I prefer to be able to lift off the throttle and coast but I can totally see why some people would like it. And if you're the sort of driver who's not very good at modulating the brakes, this will alleviate that problem because it does brake smoothly when you lift off the throttle in a way that you might not be able to. I'm looking at you, my mom. <laughs> Sorry, mom. I'm just kidding. Criticism then. So, all right, again, the ride quality. Because it's on the firm side, it can bob a bit on the motorway. And in fact, this car does feel much more comfortable at low speed and around town than it does high speed on the motorway. Past like 55, 60, this car starts to get really, really noisy. You get a lot of wind noise, you get a lot of tire noise. Basically, on the motorway, you'll be turning your torque radio station up to mad volume because you'll be having a battle with other noise. But ultimately, you'd say that the Leaf still stacks up. It's classic modern Nissan. It's 
an oxymoron, but there you go. As in, recent Nissan just doesn't do modern feeling cabins. Even the top stuff like the GTR always feels like a generation behind. And if you look at the latest Qashqai, that already looks about 10 years old to me. I haven't sat in one yet, but I'm guessing it'll feel that way too. But what Nissan does do is exceptionally well engineered cars. The Leaf is really easy to live with. It's spacious, it's well priced, it drives well, and it feels built to last. It's not the best or even the most interesting electric car on the market now. There are plenty of alternatives that will give you better looks or a better cabin or more fun or more range. It doesn't blow anything out of the water, but it's still one of the best all-rounders and therefore very easy to recommend and we'll end it there. We've done great. Thanks for watching. Really appreciate your time, especially if you've made it all the way at the end of the video. Statistically, you are, well, you're not an anomaly and you're not even in the minority, in fact, but you've done well still. You've done great, in fact. I'm just rambling now. Please watch the other stuff. I'm going. Bye.